Psalms 146, 7 to 8. The Lord gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. Let's uh, prepare our hearts to listen to the reading of the scripture. And Anne, would you come and read us? There are few people who have actually seen God face to face. The warning in scripture is that for most people, an encounter that direct would so disorient them that they would die. But there was one man in the Old Testament who saw God face to face and often. That man was Moses. And upon seeing God, Moses was changed. Turn with me to Exodus 34. Exodus 34, and we'll begin at verse 29. The radiant face of Moses. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Being in God's presence makes you shine with his light. There was a time in the New Testament where this happened again. Turn to Luke 9, Luke chapter 9, and we'll begin at verse 28. The Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James and went with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. And he was, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. So God's spirit was first revealed as fire on Mount Sinai and reflected as shining light from Moses' face. Then this shining radiant presence was revealed in Jesus, a light as bright as lightning on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then Paul writes about this phenomenon of being transformed by seeing God. I am reading about this in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3. If Paul were alive today, he would have written it in contemporary language, some, perhaps something like the message translation. So I will be reading 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. And we'll be starting in verse 7. Lifting the veil. 
The government of death, its constitution, chiseled on stone tablets, had a dazzling inaugural. Moses' face, as he delivered the tablets, was so bright that day, even though it would fade soon enough, that the people of Israel could no more look right at him than stare into the sun. How much more dazzling, then, the government of living spirit. Let's skip down to verse 12. With that kind of hope to excite us, nothing holds us back. Unlike Moses, we have nothing to hide. Everything is out in the open with us. He wore a veil so the children of Israel wouldn't notice that the glory was fading away. And they didn't notice. They didn't notice it then, and they don't notice it now. Don't notice that there's nothing left behind that veil. Even today, when the proclamations of that old bankrupt government are read out, they can't see through it. Only Christ can get rid of the veil so they can see for themselves that there's nothing there. Whenever, though, they turn to face God, as Moses did, God removes the veil, and they are face to face. They suddenly recognize that God is a living, personal presence, not a piece of chiseled stone. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old, constricting legislation is recognized as obsolete. We're free of it, all of us. Nothing between us and God, our shining faces with the brightness of his face. And so we are transfigured much like the Messiah, our lives gradually becoming brighter and more beautiful as God enters our lives and we become like him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we come now to the last message in the Ephesians series. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians, and this is the sixth message. So as we come to the conclusion of this book, I'd like to actually go back and take a bit of an overview of what this book has been saying so far. And we can summarize the book in this way. It's a, the first three chapters are a summary of the good news from God. And the second half, verse, chapters 4 through 6, is how that good news should shape every part of our lives. So what is this good news? There's a few key verses that come out of Ephesians chapter 1. And that is this. Even before he made the world, God loved us. And chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure to do that. Boy, you can feel the heartthrob of God in that, can't you? Now, if you were to take... All the gospel that you know, and summarize it into one sentence, what would you say? Well, thankfully, uh, Paul has done it for us. So here is the grand scheme of God in one sentence. This is the plan. That at the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and earth. Now that is a big plan. It's actually way bigger than just you and me and our personal salvation. It's a grand scheme for the entire cosmos that we get to be a part of. And it is a stunning Big, amazing plan. And Paul was so captured by this 
that he writes three chapters on all these things with such exuberance. And he's also aware that this is such a big concept that we are going to need help to even grasp it. And so at the end of chapter 3, he goes into a prayer. He says, when I think about all this, I just fall on my knees and I pray to the Father. And I pray that you, that we, will have power to understand this. And that it's all driven by love. And he said, I'm praying, I'm praying that somehow you will grasp how wide and how long, how high and how deep God's love is. And he said, I especially want you to experience it. This is not just a concept. This is an experience that grabs the heart. But we need God's enablement to do this because it is such a big plan. It is such a glorious thing that, that it's hard. It's hard to, to, to grasp it. In fact, he says you won't fully grasp it. But try anyway. Now, he says, when this gets a hold of you, this is what he's described in the first half of the book. This is the summary of the good news. And when this gets a hold of you, this should shape every part of your life. And so that's why in chapter 4 it says, Therefore, in light of all this, he says, I beg you, lead a life that's worthy of this calling. You are to live as children of light. And he goes on to say in that chapter, I speak with the Lord's authority on this. Don't live like the world does anymore because they're hopelessly confused. Instead, you are to live as children of light when this light enters your soul and you begin to grasp this and you've looked at God's plan face to face with Him. There is a radiance and a shift that happens deep within the soul. And He's saying that Actions and attitudes matter because they are the evidence of the heart. Words that are said matter because they reflect what's going on in the heart. Relationships matter because this is what God is all about, is bringing everything together in Christ. So therefore, he says, the way you used to live has got to quit because you're a new creation. You're a whole new person now. When you begin to catch what God is doing, you live this new life. So you put off the old life and you put on this glorious new life that is full of life. So he says it should transform everything. And then in chapter 5, he gives us uh, the model. Well, how do you make this shift? Because we know we've lived this way all our life. How do, we, how do we stop living that pattern, those old ways, those old attitudes? How do we shift and come to live this new life? How do we, how do we make, the, make the shift? In chapter 5, in verse 1, he gives us the clue. He says, imitate God in everything you do. Here's how you do it. You imitate God. In the NIV, it says, follow God's example. Um, this phrasing from the New Living Translation captures it a little bit stronger. Imitate God. Well, how do you imitate God? Well, he begins to give us examples. And actually, he shows us how to do this. And uh, the first one he talks about is in marriage. We talked about this last, last time, but I'm going to just go over this again a little bit. In marriage, we have relationships that tend, can tend to be difficult. And because of our brokenness, we can end up in painful, intense problems in marriage. And we need help to know how to be brought together. Because this coming together is the express plan of God. And it needs to be evidenced in this. So how do we bring God's life into marriage? Well, what he says is, watch what God does. Imitate God in everything that you do. So take a look at what God does. How does Jesus and the Father, how do they relate? 
Well, Jesus gives us clues. When you read the Gospels, he said, all authority has been given to me. Well, where'd that come from? Well, the Father. So the Father gives all authority to the Son. But then Jesus also said, but I don't do anything unless I ask him. And he tells me. We also read where the Son glorifies the Father. And the Father glorifies the Son. What we've got is this mutually submitting one to another. Each lifting up the other. Each encouraging the other. Each listening to the other. But it's happening both ways. And so Paul says, look at how God does that and you do that. And so that's why the next verse says, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ. Because you're looking at Christ, you get your model from looking at Him and how He relates to the Father. So submit one to another, like the Father and the Son do. Well, he also got to looking at how Jesus and the church relate. Because the Bible talks about God having this relationship with humankind, and he even couches it in marriage metaphor. So how, how does Christ treat the church, and how does the church relate to Christ? And he says, take a good look. Take a good look at what Christ does there. And he contemplated again about this, and then with that model in mind, he looks at human marriage. And you can see this in the text. So I'm going to just put the text up on the screen here. The white letters represent the comments about human marriage. The gold letters represent the comments about Christ and the church. And look at this. It's about half and half. So what Paul is doing is he's thinking and he's looking at Christ and the church and he says, Christ is the head of the church. The church submits to Christ. Christ loves the church. You see this reciprocity again? each loving, submitting to the other. It's still here, right in this picture. And he says, looking intensely at what God, what Jesus does with the church, gives us the model for how we are to be in a marriage. Husbands pouring out their lives for their wife. And wives willingly following and blessing. Now that is an amazing picture of what a marriage could be. And it comes right out of looking intensely at Jesus and the church. Now this is an amazing thing for Paul to say. In a culture of his day where women were put down. And it was very much the authoritarian model. And he's saying, no, that's not. That's how the world, that's how the Gentiles live. Don't, with the authority of Christ, I'm saying, don't live like that model anymore. Live as children of light who are illuminated by the light of God shining into them. So that's the first example of how do we live, how do we imitate God? Well, there's another set of human relationships that often get in trouble, and that is with parenting. Boy, uh, this can become very intense, the conflict between children and parents. What do we do when This ends up in a bad place. How does the gospel inform our parenting? Now remember, again, Paul is writing to people in Roman Ephesus. And this was a time in the culture where fathers exerted absolute authority over their children. They could do whatever they wanted to them. They could beat them. They could even kill them. And so how does the gospel instruct parenting? Well, he, Paul has instructions for fathers and for children, but he starts with the children. And he says to them again, imitate God in everything you do. So he says to the children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. Not because your dad's boss. Not because you are owned by your parents because... They gave life to you. No, he says, children, the reason you need to obey your parents 
is because you belong to the Lord. And what he's telling these children is to look past mom and dad and see Christ. That there is a relationship with the Lord here. Look at Christ. How does the Son relate to the Father? Get a good view of that. Well, the Son, Jesus, honored the Father. And the Father loved the Son. And Paul says, that's your model. Imitate that. That's how you do it. Then he turns and begins talking to the dads. And he says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. So you don't get a free pass, dads, to do whatever you want. And to say to your kids, now you do that because I'm your dad. That is out of order. That's the Gentile way. That's the world's way. No. The gospel introduced a whole new idea in parenting. That the feelings of the children have to be taken into consideration in how you parent. This is unknown to Roman world. In a society where the father's authority was absolute, this was revolutionary to say to the dads, don't exasperate your children, treat them properly. He goes on to say, the reason is you are to instruct them in the training and instruction of the Lord. Not your training, not your ideas or the Roman ideas, the Lord's ideas. And so when you're disciplining a child, dads, you should first be controlled yourself. What right do you have to say to your child that they need discipline when actually you need it first? Boy, Paul puts it right back on the dads here. The way of parenting is sure different than the Roman way here. You are to bring them up in the appropriate admonition and training of the Lord. And what's the Lord's training? Well, look, imitate God. Watch. Watch how God the Father and the Son relate. That's your model. That's how you parent. That's revolutionary. Well, then Paul brings up another area of life. Painful. Very painful area. And that is slaves and masters. How does that work? Slavery in this day and age of the writing of the book of Ephesians was a very bad form of slavery. Masters could do whatever they wanted with their slaves. They owned these slaves. And they could treat them with whatever they wanted. Now the parallel today would be employer-employee, but thankfully we don't have that kind of slavery model. But the parallel for us would be, okay, how, how should things work within a business? Because there can come conflict between the owner of a business and the employees of the business. And there's tension there. In fact, uh, when they do studies about um, the problems that, that, are, that come up in business, the most painful one usually is how do you manage people? Because there's a tension that goes on. Well, you think it's tough with employer-employee relationships in our world? Well, multiply that by 100 when it comes to slavery. It's really tough. So what how, how do you change, how do you imitate God when you're in a slave relationship? Well, again, here's what Paul says. You are, here in the letters again in gold, slaves obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. He's saying, Look past that mean master you've got and see this as a picture of what could be with serving God. Try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching, because picture yourself as a, as a slave of Christ. If he was Christ, how would you serve him? How would you do the will of God with all your heart? If, he was, if your master was Christ, wouldn't that change the way you serve? You would work with enthusiasm. Because you'd be working for the Lord. So he's telling the slaves that we are to look past 
the human difficulties that are here and realize that there is, there is a model in heaven that we should be looking at. If you were working for Christ, how would that affect your work? But you know what? The masters don't get off free here either. Paul turns to them and says, now masters, you better treat your slaves in the same way, so don't threaten them. Remember, you both actually have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. So the word for the master is, you're reflecting God in how you treat people. Employer, you're reflecting God to your employees. Should that not affect how you handle people? God has no favorites. He doesn't favor the owners over the employees or the masters over the slaves. He has no favorites. So here's a question that sometimes comes up. People will criticize the Bible by saying, well, the Bible doesn't speak out against slavery. It talks about slaves, you know, cooperating. It doesn't talk about revolution and about overthrowing the masters. Well, you know what? The gospel does something more powerful than direct confrontation. The gospel began to undermine the ideas that supported slavery. The idea, for example, that some people are less in value than others. The Bible undermines that and says, no, there's an equality of value here. Whether it's wife and husband or children and parent or slave and master, we are all equal. That is a revolutionary idea that is undermining, an underpinning of slavery. The dignity of all human beings. Another view that supports slavery is that some people are born to rule and some people are born to serve. The Bible says, Uno, we're all serving the same master. There are no favorites. There are no ruling classes. Not in the gospel. And the gospel began to permeate the Roman culture and in this way disrupted slavery. So not with a direct confrontation and rebellion and revolution, no. Something way more subtle than that. Way more deeper than just a temporary revolution. And so he says, look, imitate God in how you handle slavery employee-employee relationships. This becomes your model. And Paul, you remember, he's writing all this in jail. <laughs> he's in the custody of Roman soldiers. And at the end of his book here, he reflects on the fact that there is a, there is a tension in the universe about these matters. That the way of God is quite different than the way of the world. And there is a tension. In fact, it's, it's, it's like a war going on. And Paul is sitting in jail looking at Roman soldiers. All around him are these armed men. Weapons on them. And he's looking at them. Now, you, you have a good reason. If you were sitting in jail with a guy like this in charge of you to be depressed, to be upset, angry, you want to get out of here. But Paul also looks past the immediate challenge or the immediate problem that he's in, and he's, he looks to see spiritual, spiritual matters here. And he, point, he was thinking about this. You know, when, if you were to meet a man like this, a man with a sword and a shield, and you met him on the road, and it's just you, and you meet this person, there would be a little bit of angst in your heart. This guy can do you a lot of harm. Now, if all the armor was gone and the shield and the, and the sword and everything was gone, it was just another man, well, you might take him on. But when he's armed, you don't take him on. Paul says, arms make you stronger than you naturally are. And he saw a spiritual truth here. He said, hey, we could put on spiritual armor <laughs> 
which actually makes us more powerful than we are in our own strength. And he gets this idea that we're not actually fighting the Romans. He says, that's not really the issue here. We're fighting principalities and powers. There's a spiritual war going on, and therefore there are spiritual weapons that we are to wear. And what he does is he's looking at his Roman guard, and he gets to thinking, well, what's the spiritual model here? And he actually tells us how to put on the armor of God in the order that, that these guys would be putting on their armor. And he says, okay, let's put on, verse 13, put on every piece of God's armor, starting with the belt of truth. That's underneath all the armor. There's a belt they wore in which they hooked everything together. You start with the belt of truth, and then you put on the breastplate of righteousness, and then you get your feet with the right shoes of readiness from the gospel of peace, and then you pick up your shield of faith, make sure you put on your helmet of salvation, and you pick up your sword of the Spirit, and then you pray. And you know, when you do that, you are way more powerful than you are on your own. Because you have picked up weapons. And you can resist the devil because you've got weapons. And Paul says, put on the armor of God. Let's go to spiritual battle over these matters. Well, do you see what Paul is doing? It's quite amazing. Where did Paul get this idea to think like this, to look at marriage, not as marriage, but as look at Christ in the church and then transforming it. Where, where do you get the idea of looking at a, a, an armed soldier and saying, hey, there's a spiritual picture here? You know where he got it from? It was from Jesus. This was the way Jesus thought and taught. It says in the New Testament, he always told stories. So Jesus would be walking along the road and you see beautiful flowers. And he would tell a spiritual story about flowers, through flowers. Or he'd be listening to the sparrows chirping in the trees and he'd say, now there's a spiritual, there's a spiritual picture. Or he'd be walking along, he's hungry, he's looking for some figs and there's no figs on the tree. Well, he turns that into a spiritual lesson. Do you see what Jesus does? Everywhere he walks, he sees God. God's ways. Everything becomes a parable. Everything becomes an illustration of a spiritual truths. And if you will open your eyes, you can see God's truth everywhere. And no matter what situation you're in, even if you're a prisoner under an armed guard, there can be a spiritual truth here. And so Paul says, I'm like a prisoner of Christ. So what is in your life that's pressuring you or you don't like or you wish was different? Put on the eyes of Christ as shown by Paul in these examples as well and learn how to see the kingdom happening even in that. Look to see how there could be a gospel, good news, peace in whatever you're facing. So, you walk out of church today, it's stinking cold out there. And there's white snow everywhere. How could that be a picture of spiritual truth? Let your mind search and instead of complaining about the cold, like I do, look for a spiritual picture that might be evident if you just stop and look and think and pray in the Spirit. Your whole life, your whole life can be walking in the presence and the goodness of God everywhere you go. So if there's one book in the Bible that you would like to really get a grip on? And what is the gospel really all about? And how does that affect your life? It'd be the book of Ephesians. Well worth your reading and contemplating. Thank you, dear Jesus, for modeling for us how to live life as a parable, how to see God in everything. 
and things as simple as sparrows and flowers and seeds, you are showing us that God is evident and that creation all around us is pouring forth speech for those who will listen. Father, we want to be those who listen well. Look at this benediction here, which summarizes this transformation experience. We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory. The more we look, and the longer we look, the more the light shines in us. That's how we live as children of light.